this morning. Do you know that God is with you? Do you know that God is with you? For those who said yes to themselves, let me ask this question to follow that one up. How do you know that God is with you? Is it because the blessings you have in this life, a clean bill of health, a healthy family, or safety in the country we have or we dwell in? Could it be a good job, a nice bank account, or a lovely home that you sleep in? Is it the relationships you have with your family, your friends, your coworkers? What do you conceive of how you know the Lord is with you? I would argue that the only way one can truly know that God is with them is because you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good over and over and over through the Bible, through your life, through the community, through your personal testimony. God has opened your eyes to see his glory. God has breathed a new life into you so you can taste his glory because God has chosen that you will receive mercy that you did not deserve because of his kindness and grace. This Lord's Day, I want to take some time to show you that God has always been and forever will be with his people. That's how we will know that God is with us through his word. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ tomorrow, I would like to unpack this reality and the birth narrative of his beloved son, Jesus. And our main point today is simple. God is with us. I'm not trying to make this complex. I'm trying to keep it simple, keep the main thing the main thing. Today's main point is God is with us. And we're going to talk about how God promised his people Emmanuel and how God provides his people Emmanuel and how God prompts us, his people, to walk with Emmanuel daily. My hope for us today is for you and I to see in Scripture that God desires to be with you, to desire to be with his people through the good, through the bad, and through the ugly. But let's first talk about how God is with his people Emmanuel. I know we're in Matthew 1 right now, but if you can, if you're able, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. We're not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to read some verses so we can understand the context of what Matthew is quoting. Again, in, in Matthew, he quotes, Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And this is from Isaiah 7:14. But to understand why Matthew uses this quote, we must understand what happens in chapter 7. Read with me verse 1. In the day of Ahazah, the son of Jotham, son of Uzai, the king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekin, the son of Ramallah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. Now, in the context of what's going on in chapter 7, the southern kingdom of Judah is on the brink of war with the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria. See, there's a power struggle going on in this land. And Israel and Syria were trying to replace the king of Judah, a wicked king, with someone who would do Israel and Syria's personal bidding. But King Ahaz was afraid to lose his throne. And Judah was afraid to lose the royal bloodline of King David that stemmed from their king. They were scared to the core. They were described as weak leaves on a branch, barely holding on before the coming storm in chapter 7. But God sends Isaiah to bring Judah a word of comfort. Despite their wicked king and the surrounding armies closing in, God sends Isaiah to remind his people that God is with them. And the rumors of destruction will not come to pass. Because God also knows the heart of man. How fickle it can be accepting what God has to say. So in chapter 7, even though he declares to them, I am with you, God says, I'll also give you a sign. The promised sign comes about the prophecy of Emmanuel. Jump down to verse 13 with me. It says, 
he, Isaiah, said to said, Hear then, O house of David, it is too little for you to weary, to you weary men, that you weary or worry about my God also. Therefore the Lord himself will give a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. God is saying that his people will hear a promise coming from God. God is purposely promising himself to come and be among his people physically, to come and bring his people comfort to their fears, to come and bring relief in their struggles, to come and give people a hope when all seems lost. That beautiful thing about the promise is that we see this today, that promise fulfilled as a son of God coming to earth, and we celebrate that tomorrow. But in that moment, what Isaiah and the people were going through, they had to place their hope into God's word and the promised son, the promised sign that the son of God is coming. And he's coming not only as God incarnate, but also Emmanuel, God being with us. So as we understand the situation that Isaiah was going through with Judah, with the surrounding nations, we can probably understand what's going on then in the Gospel of Matthew. Jump back with me with chapter 1. Now to give some context about the first chapter of Matthew, it follows a period of silence from God. There was a dark and challenging time for the people of God. And when you turn the pages of time in our Bible from the Old Testament to the New that period, that blank page is over 400 years. God's last word comes to the prophet Malachi, who tells the people of God about the last Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist, will come like Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. And Matthew picks up right where Malachi leaves, left off. So Matthew, the gospel itself, is written to the Jews to prove that Jesus Christ is the long-awaited Messiah they have been promised. Matthew specifically writes about Christ's life to show how Jesus fulfills all the prophecies declared about him, with se several major themes woven through Scripture. One of the main themes is God being with his people. Like all Jewish historical documents about kings and rulers, those who write those documents need to prove that the king they're writing about is truly royalty. They provide that, that person's genealogy so that it can trace and verify that lineage really does come from blood. That's why you have the first 17 verses of the Gospel of Matthew, the genealogy of Christ, to prove that Jesus is the son of David. But it's interesting about how 17 verses are dedicated to the genealogy of Christ, but only one part of one verse is dedicated to Jesus' divine genealogy. Why is that? You ever thought about that? Why do we transition from verse 1 through 17 and just jump into the birth and narrative of Christ and it's just one verse about the divine side of Jesus, his divine nature? Scholars and theologians argue that Matthew only gives us one verse about his divinity because they argue that the early church and the first-hand witnesses of the miracles of Christ and the life of Christ and the resurrection of Christ already was enough evidence that this man, this rabbi, this person was son of God. There was something different about him. So instead of having tried to prove that this man was God incarnate, what Matthew had to do was to connect that God to his human divinity, to prove to the Jews that he is actually from David. I thought that was a beautiful, interesting thought. That it said, we in this world always are trying to make this man God. We have to argue that Jesus is God. Or in that time, they're like, nah, man, we've got we to argue that this God is actually man. His, his two natures are one. I think it's a beautiful thought concept to, to think about. What Matthew had to do was to prove that Jesus was he, was the king, was the long-awaited son of David of royal blood. Verse 18 tells us that Jesus' mother, Mary, was found with child from the Holy Spirit while being betrothed to Joseph. I do not have much time to talk and discuss about the Hebrew process of marriage, 
which involves two main stages, the, the patrol period, and then the marriage ceremony. But as they step into the patrol period, it's like us ver our version today of engagement, but in the Jewish customs, they're considered legally married. But they have to wait an entire year in preparation for the marriage ceremony. So Boo and Boo, like Groom and Bri, like they don't see each other for a year. They don't spend time with each other. They spend time with their families. But yet they're preparing to be married. They're preparing to be one. And so Joseph, wanting to be with Mary, wanting to love, one day finds out she's pregnant. Exactly. Uh oh. Like I, there should be a good night. That happened, man. That's, that's a whole different conversation. I love my wife. We're not going to talk about this later. But, but in the reality, like, can you imagine receiving that news that the woman that you've been longing for in this time period that she shows up and says, hey, I, I have a baby in me. And you'd be like, whose baby is that? Like, you know, right? Exactly. Let's be real. It's okay. Russell's not here. I can do what I want. Bam. Right? Cool. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. But we are recording. Yes, we are. <laughs> but in verse 19, we see Joseph respond to the news of his wife legally, the, the one he's betrothed to, and how he chooses to resolve and to divorce her quietly. As we know very little about Joseph, Jesus' father, in the Bible, we see that he's described as a just man or other translations as a righteous man. Not only was he a righteous man, but he was also a man deeply in love with his bride-to-be, Mary. And he was unwilling to put the love, for, the love of his life to shame. He was still wanting to protect her. But in verse 20, we see that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. The angel shows up and tells Joseph not to worry about the pregnancy, but to know that God is at work in his life and his wife. Can we take a moment to appreciate Joseph for a second? Again, not much is written about this young man. But what we do see him not only described as a righteous man, described as a man who loves his wife, but also a patient man. Remember, he, he, in all, he could, in all legal parameters, have, can divorce her quickly. He could have rushed to the point. He could have followed the Deuteronomy law and brought her in front of a judge and in front of people divorced her and put her to shame. He could have done that. But instead, he had patience. He didn't rush him. He didn't rush to divorce her. And that patience led him to something miraculous. He got to hear from God. Think about that for a second. A man who, who had all right to divorce his wife quickly because she was pregnant by Jewish law, took time to think about the one he loves, to not to put her to shame publicly. But his patience allowed him to see, to hear in a dream, the angel, an angel of the Lord coming and say, do not be afraid. Family, we can take note of the life of Joseph and sometimes be more patient in our trials and our tribulations so we can hear from God. I know that is something that I'm growing in because your boy is still flesh. When there's problems in this world, I want to run to solutions from the world. When I'm struggling with my emotions, I want to dive deeper into my emotions into the quicksand instead of stopping, instead of breathing, instead of considering and waiting to hear something from the Lord. I wonder if that's you today. I wonder what you're going through, the trials at home, the trials at work, this Christmas season, trying to look right, to have all things together to celebrate tomorrow, that deep down inside, you're struggling, you're hurting. May we be like Joseph and be patient to hear from the Lord, to hear from God. As Joseph is waiting, um, he, he gets a word from the Lord that says not to fear, but also to think about what to name his son. Now, to me, 
naming a child a baby and brand new infant, I think is one of the hardest things in the world, right? Just me personally, because I'm like, you're about to declare what this person for the rest of their life is about to be called. And I, I think like, you have to be careful what you choose. You have to be thoughtful of what you choose because in some cultures, when you name a child, that name represents something about that family or that name represents something about who they desire them to be. Like, Lord willing, if the Lord allows my wife and I to have babies, I want my child to have a strong name, like Leonidas. <laughs> like, like Denzel, right? I want some strong names, right? I'm also afraid to call him because I don't want him to come out or her to come out and have this strong, maculous name and be this small, we, you, you know what I mean, right? Like, uh, you know what I mean, right? You pick it up and put it down. But at the same time, like, I remember Shimika and I were talking one time. She's like, hey, what, what do you want to be your baby? And I was like, hear me out. She's like, no. I was like, hear me out. I was like, Marcus Aurelius. She was like, Marcus Aurelius. I was like, doesn't that just roll off the tongue? Marcus Aurelius, Roque. Like, it just rolls right off the tongue. She was like, <laughs> no. Because um, she was like, what, why? And I explained, like, who he was. And she was like, we're not naming our child Marcus Aurelius. I was like, girl, bye. But the reality is that, as that is my big fear of wanting to have my child have a strong name that they can live up to, Joseph didn't have to worry about that. He didn't have to get in trouble because look with me, verse 21. The angel says, she, your wife, will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Jesus is a form of the Hebrew name Joshua or Yeshua, which has the basic meaning of Jehovah or Yahweh will save. Matthew tells the reader that Joseph's kid is purpose for something great from the job. His name is Yahweh will save. And who would Joseph's son save? His people from their sins, from the greatest thing they need. He could have said from famine. He could have said from poverty. He could have said blank, but he says from their sins. Family, you and I need a Jesus in our life. Of all the things in the world that we are struggling with, the biggest thing that we need to deal with is our sins. See, Jesus' name is his office. He is the God who saves. And Emmanuel is his nature, God with us. History tells us that famous kings and rulers of the world give themselves titles to show off their fleeting glory, like Alexander the Great. Richard the Lionheart. Kang the... Thank you for the one person who watched Marvel. Ten points. Love you guys. Kang the Conqueror. But the Son of God was content to call himself Savior. Think about that. Of all the names he could have declared himself, he comes and says, I am your Savior. I am with you. Family, if you, if you don't know Jesus today, the Savior that we're talking about, we're talking about a God who cares and loves and desires you to the point that even though you are in sin before him and have not able to confess sin without him opening your heart to see your sin, God came to this earth as a little baby boy. God came to this earth to live the perfect life that you and I were called to do that we couldn't do because of our sin. He died the atonement. He died a death so that you and I could be reconciled with him. This is the Bible's ultimate gift to you. This is the ultimate gift we can give to anyone in this world. When we think about the presents we're wrapping, whatever wrapping paper we're trying to give, think about what ultimately people really need. It's Jesus. That is the gospel message. That is the reason why Matthew inks and love this entire gospel. So you and I in the world may taste and see and know that the Lord is good. Back in verse 22, Matthew reminds us that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has promised by the prophet, specifically Isaiah. 
The phrase to fulfill what the Lord has pro- spoken or promised is a common phrase throughout the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to read off a couple of them so you can see that this is not something that Matthew writes about as out of pocket. He is purposefully writing words for you and I to see that Christ fulfills all the requirements to be our Savior. From the flight to Egypt in chapter 2, verse 13 through 15, to the return to Nazarene, chapter 2, 19 through 23, Christ healing the sick, chapters 8, 14 through 17, Jesus is a chosen God's servant, chapter 12 through 15 through 21. Again, these are all moments in Scripture that Christ fulfills what's required of him. The teaching of Christ, chapter 13 through 34 through 35 in parables, Christ's triumphal entry in 21, 1 through 5, and even the betrayal and the passion of Christ, chapter 26, and many more. Matthew wants you to know that as God is with us, as God is dwelling with his people, he's fulfilling what's required. What our hearts long for is fulfilled in him. What our hearts desire and our hearts need is fulfilled in Christ. Don't go to the things of the world. Don't go to your emotions. Bring those to Christ and allow, and allow Christ to show you how it's fulfilled in him. Matthew wants us to know that this Jesus, this Emmanuel, has come to fulfill all the needs for the atonement of God and for his people and to be God with us. So as we talked about a little bit of the context of Isaiah to explain why Matthew chooses that verse, we talk a little bit about the life of how Emmanuel becomes with us, or God becomes Emmanuel with us. Let's talk about how God prompts his people to walk with Emmanuel daily. So let's ask that question. How do you and I walk daily with Emmanuel? To answer this question, we must ask why God inspired Matthew to write this story in his gospel. The answer simply is, because it matters, because it matters to Jesus, because it matters that Jesus allows you to know that he is Emmanuel. Jesus wants his people to know that God is with them, no matter the situation. We sometimes take the phrase Emmanuel given to Christ as some cute thing for this season to write on a card, or simply a prayer of hope. But Matthew uses it as a statement, as a declaration for all mankind to let his people know, those who are redeemed, that despite of what's happening in the world today, God is with you. Remember what's going on in the time of Isaiah. God used the prophet to tell God's people that he was with them despite living under a wicked king, and despite the rumors of coming war. Remember what's going on in the time of Matthew. God used a broken tax collector to tell God's people that he was with them despite living under the tyranny of Roman law and not hearing from God for 400 years. Remember, family, today, God is with you. I think so many times that one of the greatest commandments that we have in the whole Old Testament is simply to remember. And when we remember what God has declared, what we remember what God has done, we get to see God fully. We get to hear what God is doing. So when you're struggling at work, struggling to know if you have a job, God is with you. In this holiday season, as you're mourning the loss of family, remember God is with you. As you're struggling with your family who seem they're more walking away from the faith, and you're on your knees and praying to God, God, what, 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 what do we need to do? God is with you as you're struggling to create a family, as you're struggling to embrace your family, that are difficult, God is with you. When you have friends who reject you because of your faith, when you have family who turn away from you because they can't stand how you submit to your God, God is with you. As you're becoming parents, as you're leading ministries, as you're filling the blank of your life, God is with you. I did not know how much I needed this text this week. One thing in seminary they teach you very clearly is when you're trying to write a sermon, if the, if the sermon doesn't work on your heart, work on what's going on in your life, don't, don't preach it. Put it to the side, let someone else do the work. 
because you're not ready for it. And I re- did not realize how much this, this text jacked me up this week. I have a grandmother um, who is 89, going to turn 90 this year, who has been married to her husband for over 30 years. And her husband will be 98 in January. And during the September and Thanksgiving season, we found out that she has dementia. And my mom told me very quickly that her dementia has went from the very number one, number two stage to six in less than a month because of her alcoholism for decades. And I, and I talked to my mom, and she's trying to be hard. She's trying to be strong for her little boy. My heart weeps for her because I know she's preparing to say goodbye to a loved one. And all I want to do is just love my mom and help my mom. But God had to remind me this week, I'm with her. As she is mourning, as she's preparing, as she's doing fill the blank, I am Emmanuel, I am with her. That gives me hope and gives me peace. That despite what our family is going through, despite what I'm going through, God is with us. For some of you guys also know, my beautiful bride and I have been going on for two years of trying to start a, a family. I know it's crazy to think a little boppo was running around. Like, or shabapos, as some people told us. But we have been this journey for two years. And there are times where I get announcements of like, hey, we're pregnant. Not us, but friends of ours. And it's been easy to be like, man, I'm so happy for you. Let me hug you. What can we do? But if I'm honest, this week was very tough. It was probably the most difficult one because I got a friends of mine who told us before they put on social media that like, hey, we're pregnant. And I was legit grateful for that. I was like, I'm so happy for you that you guys are having a baby. Praise God for that miracle. And this week, I also had to go to the hospital to visit one of my disciples who, on Monday at 3.30 in the morning, had their baby girl. And I went to the hospital, and I saw the family. I saw the joy that they had of just welcoming a new, new member of the family, a granddaughter to a mother. And I got to see both the young man get saved, I got to see the mother get saved, and I'm looking at this daughter that they hold this little infant, and I'll be praying for her salvation. But the little sister was like, hey, Bobo, do you want to hold the baby? And I was like, no. She was like, why? I was like, no, I don't want to hold the baby. And the young man who I disciple knows that the joke that I say to people, I'm afraid to crush a kid because I'm so big, so I don't hold the baby. But the reality of why I don't hold the infant of anyone who I went to the hospital is because the first baby I want to hold, I want it to be my, I want it to be my own. And I went to visit the hospital to celebrate the life of this little girl. Here's a reality check on the way home. I may never get to do it. And in that moment, I went straight to my wife. And I just bawled. I cried. Because this sermon was jacking me up. Because in the midst of that pain, in the midst of the desire, in the midst of probably potentially never, I don't know, the Lord allowed that to happen. God said, I am with you. I am Emmanuel. Despite your pains, I'm here for you. And I need to t- teach that. I need to preach that. I got to show that. Because it matters to Jesus. Family, the, the trials you'll go through, the pains you go through, the one that you constantly need right now is this narrative story of Jesus, the God who saves, is also Jesus, the manual God with you. In your pain, in the good times and ugly, God is with you. Family, God's promises people to be Emmanuel. Of the book of Isaiah. We see in Matthew how God accomplishes a becoming Emmanuel to his people. We're reminded that God includes the story because it matters to him that we know 
we, his chosen people, are able to walk with Emmanuel because Emmanuel walks with us. He's not a guy dead in a tomb. He's risen alive in heaven, walking with all of us daily. So what do we do with this? Three things, and then I'll get it. First, I want to ask you, this God that we're talking about, is he with you? Are you in a relationship with Jesus Christ that you can know and taste and see firsthand daily? The Lord is with you because you've repented and confessed of your sins. And he does not call you alien or stranger. He calls you beloved son and daughter. Next, I want to ask you, what does your daily walk look like with Emmanuel? Are you studying and seeing in scripture of him fulfilling the promises that we talked about in Man- and through all of Matthew, of God walking with his people in scripture? Are you like Joseph and taking time to be patient so you can hear from God instead of rushing through your prayer and rushing through your Bible study because you got to watch ESPN or you need to go get your Starbucks or you need to wrap some more presents because you forgot that you had some left in the closet. Are you rushing through things? Or are you being patient like Joseph? See how in Exodus, across the Red Sea, Emmanuel was with his people. See how during the 40 years in the desert, Emmanuel was with his people. Some of us might be struggling. Do, we, do I know that God is with me? How do I know God is with me daily? I challenge you to ask, are you spending time with him to see that he is with you daily? We also see him daily within each one of us, the body of Christ. Family, are you sharing what's going on in your life with one another so we can help encourage and equip each other up for the ministry of the gospel? Not only study your God's word, not only dwelling within the church, but are you deeply committed in prayer, walking with your God as he walks with you? Lastly, are you going with him to the nations? What I mean by that, and we're going to talk about this more next week, because it'll be a fun fact if you don't know, the first thing declared about Jesus being Emmanuel in the Gospel of Matthew it's the exact same thing he says at the end when he gives the Great Commission and he finishes the last line, Behold, I am with you to the end of age. The whole life of Christ is being with his people. We're going to unpack that more next week. But are you taking the testimonies of your life, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to your neighbor? When you spend time with your family, if you do tomorrow, are you worried about if the food's done? Are you more worried about, have I talked to my family about Jesus? Can I give them the greatest gift in the world, which is Emmanuel, God with us? As we have sung, silent night, holy night, joy to the world. Oh, come, oh, come, all Emmanuel, Jesus at the center. May that be for us in our daily life, asking God to come in the stillness of the light, night to be the center of our because he is Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace. We thank you that despite our struggles, despite our pains and what we're going through, that we neglect to remind ourselves that you are with us that we choose to run to things of this world and not run to the gospel. Lord, I ask you in your kindness, if there's anyone here who's wrestling with things, wrestling with doubts, wrestling with pains, wrestling with suffering, and because they have not chosen to walk with you to be your son and daughter, I pray that you open their hearts to see their need for Christ, their need for Jesus, the Savior of the world, who would take away the sins. And for those who are here today, Lord, I pray for those who are going through trials, they're going through heaviness, that they're able to share, confess, and to remind themselves and to other people, Emmanuel, God with us, is with us. I ask all these things and for the King's glory, advancing the King's kingdom, I pray. Amen.
Normally, family, we have a time where we do communion, but um, since we're also in here, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to just spend some time in prayer. I know I just prayed towards the end of the sermon, but we're going to spend some time with prayer. I, I want to encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever work he might be doing right now in you. There he is that, my, that pricks a little bit, that, that holy nudge, as I've been told. Spend some time talking to God about that. And then Miss Kaylin will come up and she will lead us on our last song. Take some time to pray, family. Merry Christmas, everyone. We sing together. Joy to the world, the Lord is born. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart Prepare him more and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing the joy the joy the joy of the Lord is my strength the joy the joy joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, he is my home. Somebody say the joy, joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And we say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa.
with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love Say, the joy the joy the joy of the lord is my strength the joy the joy the joy of the Lord is my strength. We say, oh, he is my hope. Somebody say the joy, the joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And we walk in joy. Receive this benediction, family, this prayer. Father, the joy of the world has come and is coming again one day. But we celebrate tomorrow a time the joy of the Lord is our strength. May that strength continue to build us up, to walk with us as has been declared in Emmanuel, God with us. I ask all these things for the King's glory, the advancement of the King's kingdom, I pray. Amen. <laughs>